<laughs> Welcome to March, everyone. And you know what that means. It's college football time. All right. Uh, this is our Ohio State Buckeyes football live show each and every Wednesday with you. We got Tony Gerdeman at the top from Buckeye Scoop, Buckeye Groves, uh, Kevin Noon, and of course, Steve Hellwagon from 247 Sports. Bucknuts, how you boys doing today? Good. Doing good. Okay. Good, good, good. Uh, we, of course, uh, have now some announced times here. This is a good thing. So we've been speculating about spring practice. We had a spring game date. But now we know that uh, March 19th, Steve, starts us out with uh, spring practice for the Buckeyes. Yeah, exciting stuff. We've got a date in mind, and uh, the Buckeyes will be – uh, getting started, it uh, looks like April 17th is kind of the day they set aside uh, right now for the spring game, and we'll see uh, what format that is and if uh, any number of fans are able to attend that game or not. Right now, the governor, I think, allowing 30% of capacity outside, which uh, at Ohio Stadium would be roughly 25,000 people, maybe 30,000 people. So uh, that that's – you know, again, we don't have a lot of details, but uh, at least we got a start date. The idea that there might be a spring game, and um, that's important for a team that didn't have spring football at all last year for Ohio State uh, to be able uh, to go through 15 days of spring practice. We assume they're still going through uh, all the various COVID-19 protocols with the daily testing and everything else. Uh, with uh, the off-season program and everything else that's going on right now. But uh, uh, moving toward uh, what looks like it could be somewhat normal season in 2021, uh, kind of, so or, or maybe normaler than what we had in uh, 2020. I thought it was interesting that Alabama's athletic director came out this week and said they're planning to go full full throttle with full stadiums this season. I know recently he had talked about not knowing what's going to happen with the spring game, and that's what Gene Smith has said. Although, I think Gene said last week they're probably they won't they're not planning on selling tickets. I, I still think there's there's no reason there shouldn't be some people in the stadium if there's been so many thousands of people vaccinated and uh, and you're also in, in using um, you know, social distancing. With the Blue Jackets are at twenty five percent capacity, I think right now. Yeah. So I think there's no reason you can't combine these two things and get some people in there and, and use the, the, the DeWine 30% and put 32,000 people in the spring game, which granted they probably won't be able to put that many in if we're talking about just people who are vaccinated and, uh, and then a, a smaller portion. But I would, at this point, I'm, I'm ready for decision makers to stop making the easy decision of let's just not do anything. And, and start making the decision of let's figure out how to do this. And I think we're moving towards that. But but a spring game, it, maybe it's just like, ah, eh, it's just a spring game. We don't need to push anything right now. Even though Ryan Day has said that, you know, he wants he wants his spring practices to be uh, have as many game-like situations as possible. One way to do that, which is what Urban Meyer always liked, was the spring game because there's a crowd there. And it's your first chance to see what these kids do in front of a crowd and no, maybe 25,000 people isn't going to sway them, but it's an opportunity for them to play in front of people and for people to see them and to see how they react in front of a crowd. You mean kicking the can down the road, the way that the NC two a has with, uh, yeah. with letting the dead period go and things along those lines. I mean, yes. no, we're never going to get to that point. I mean, we were able to sit there and see a national championship game that was played in front of X amount of fans or whatnot. And, you know, I can't see any circumstance why we wouldn't be able to at least hit that type of number here. But, you know, we don't know. There are going to be a lot of questions in there. And and I guess it's going to be interesting to see what happens if, you know, and I'm, hopefully it doesn't happen anywhere, but that if a program runs into some sort of outbreak or something and how do they, you know, how do they uh, weather that? Does, do they get the option to shut down for X amount of days and still get their 15 days, or do they have to be done by the end of a certain window? I mean, there's certainly a lot more questions than there are answers right now, but it certainly feels like a little bit of return to normalcy to have some dates on a calendar at least. And while I'm expecting us not to be anywhere near the fields over at the Woody for uh, spring practice, uh, 
You know, I plan on trying to climb onto the roof of the Fawcett Center with a real good zoom lens and see if I can figure out what's going on over there. Yeah, I think the first real feeling of normalcy when will be when we're back in the WAC, either in the practice field, somewhere in the building with the players, like sharing the same indoor facility space with the players. Because we, we were in the Ohio Stadium for practice last year, and of course, you know, we were there watching them play. But it, until, like, we are indoors with the players, I don't think – We'll actually be back to normalcy, but you know, as long as we continue to try to get there, I, I, I would be happy. Yeah, how more difficult was it to cover the team this past season? Not because of the pandemic, because you had to filter everything through the pandemic and report on the pandemic and its ramifications on the games, but because you were removed from the team. It sucked. I, well, for well, it, it, it's nice to be able to do it from home rather than drive to campus and then stand around for an hour waiting to talk to players. But you're everybody gets the same stuff, you know, the way we did it this year. And uh, you can't you can't be one person at a table talking to a player or, or three people at a, pl- a table talking to, like, this linebacker while everybody is with Justin Fields. So you, there's it's hard to be unique and hard to create unique content when – we're all getting the same five minutes of players and the same quotes. And so like there are already so many outlets covering Ohio state and the same stories are being written this past year was was worse than ever because you all had the same content. And so uh, you, you all had the same quotes and pretty much cranking out, you know, however many ingredients you have, it it just all turns into bread. And no no matter what store has it, it, it's all just a bunch of different versions of, of bread. And so it was hard to create unique content, with uh, just going based off of Zooms. And when you're on a Zoom, if you're lucky, you get a follow-up. And a lot of times it's not the first question or the second question that gives you the answer that you're looking for or what you want to be able to do. It's being at that that table, as Tony mentioned, without three other reporters and you kind of all look at each other and do the hand signals and you know, hey, I'm going to ask a couple back-to-back and you build off of it and then that's where the answer comes from. It's a lot more sterile, a lot more anesthetized the way that it's been on Zoom. Probably an SID's dream, but a reporter's nightmare. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can't talk to players. You ask them questions. You can't talk to coaches. You ask them questions. And if you don't get called on early enough and things are – and the time is ticking down, you don't get a follow-up and you'll get cut off. And it, and so, yeah, it makes it difficult to, to get what you want. And um, then, uh, you know, I, I think the product suffers. Yeah, so what I got out of all that is, of course, I hung on every word, but the the one thing was that uh, Tony mentioned uh, with all the outlets covering Ohio State football. So if, if you come across, Tony, you know, any college football fan bases out there that are being underserved, you know you know who to contact right, right here. So, so we can always fill that void. We're, we're always looking to do that. So between the three with, of you, and I'll start with Steve, what do you get out of spring practice? I, I know you get uh, from covering it myself uh, way back when, being on the field, just getting a feel for is something that can't necessarily be described, just being able to cover the team better, uh, having those conversations with people rather than just question, answer. Um, you know, it seems like there's been such a lockdown on it. Uh, you know, in, in hearing from you three, but a ton of other people that there's been such a lockdown on the access to practice. This is before the pandemic that what, what do you get out of spring practice in regards to what has been the, the, the most valid or credible piece of information or what you have gotten out of spring practice typically? Well, I would just say, if you're allowed to go and watch at least, you know, four or five of the 15 practices, you can get a sense of who the coaches are truly looking at to make up the team in the fall. I think that's probably the, the biggest thing. And that's what people really are interested in is who, who really is going to emerge and be the guys who are going to be on the field in the fall. And that's where people kind of channel their their thought and their energy toward, um, you know, is it productive? Is it counterproductive? Is it important? Uh, probably not. But to me, it's the development of the young players 
And for us, the chance, uh, I mean, we've never really seen, uh, in this instance, Jack Miller or C.J. Stroud uh, do anything with an Ohio State uh, jersey on. I mean, I guess Stroud ran for a touchdown against Michigan State, and Miller ran for one uh, in a game uh, earlier in the season. But other than that, uh, we've never really seen those guys do much of anything. So it's an opportunity, I think, to, to get out there, if you have a chance to observe at least, and, and see exactly this is the guy, these are the guys we're talking about, and this is why. This is what makes this guy special from what we're able to ascertain watching them live. So uh, to me, that that's important. Uh, and, and again, to, to bring as much of that home to the to the viewer, I mean, they, they're not allowed to go to practice you know, either pretty much. So uh, they want to they want to see every little bit of uh, whatever they get their hands on is better than the zero that uh, that they normally get. So I think those are probably the areas that uh, – People are looking at just a small dollop and some hope, I guess, going uh, going toward uh, what they hope is going to be a big season in the fall. Yeah, I mean, spring, you know, we, we get to see, you know, small windows of things. I mean, so, I mean, we can tell you on a normal spring who stretches the best, who, you know, who who's the most flexible and is able to do all of that. And then right around at the end of period three, all right, you guys got to go. Uh, we'll see in a little bit for interviews or whatever. And then, you know, if we were lucky, we might get one practice where we have to put away recording media and we could, you know, go old school and write down notes or whatnot. But it is a first opportunity to see some of these young guys and not even necessarily the first year guys. It could be second year guys because one, we're not seeing practice in the regular season Two, if they weren't seeing much playing time or whatever. And just, you know, it, it's important because it just, I think in a lot of ways it helps validate some of the things we may be hearing from sources. When you talk to a lot of sources, there are a lot of guys who are doing well, but unless we see it, we don't know what is bravado, what is real or whatever. So it's a good way to kind of validate what it is we're being told and be able to, you know, frame that stuff properly to be able to convey it to our readers. So, you know, I think spring is very important. Uh, would I want to go out there and see all 15 practices in full? Not really, but if Tony and Steve are going there, you better believe I'm going to be there. I'm not going to be the one not to show up, but, uh, you know, it's an interesting mix. Yeah, that is the great thing about this beat. Uh, if somebody else is going to be there, you got to be there. The, the whole uh, fall camp hotel uh, scene where players check in the hotel, and it's now it's like a, an annual pilgrimage. Everybody has to be there taking pictures. But I love spring football because it's – it's just another season to me. It, it's there's fall football and there, there's spring football. And it's only, you know, from like mid February to about May first, you can talk about it, and it, it gives us something to produce and uh, makes us feel like we're accomplishing something. But like like Kevin, you get to see the new the new guys, the young guys, the guys, the redshirt freshmen, the redshirt sophomores. I like seeing the true freshmen who stand out, like Garrett Wilson right away, first spring practice we saw. And then Jackson Smith and Jigba, we saw one practice last year, spring football, practice one, and the dude was catching everything. He looked awesome. And and so, like that, Kevin says, this validates what you're being told, what you've seen with your own eyes in, in high school. You can watch Jackson Smith and Jigba, watch him you know, go for like 2,400 receiving yards and think, that guy's pretty good. He catches a lot of stuff. And then you see him one time in, in an Ohio State jersey, and he's doing all of that same stuff. So it's not a surprise he was like uh, the, the fourth leading receiver on the team or something last year, even if, um, you know, he, he only averaged like 4.9 yards per, per catch. But I like it because you, you see new guys, you see uh, some semblance of a depth chart, and a lot of times it's almost like just soothsaying, reading the innards of, of, of things because you don't necessarily get to see scrimmage of any sort. You see like – well, this is the guy is jogging first. This is the guy that's jogging second. You you sort of build a depth chart that way, and it's like, or the way they rep. If Justin Fields in 2019 reps with the first team every single time, and Ryan Day continues to say, "Well, we don't know who the starting quarterback is going to be." Like, well, okay, you can tell us that, but we know from what we've seen that there is no controversy here. There is no quarterback battle, and if Justin Fields is going to 
or Gunnar Hoker or whomever, Matthew Baldwin or whatever is going to be the starter. Maybe they should get some first team reps, but they don't. So you know who it's going to be. So I just, it's just more information. And as closed off as Ohio State is from the media, any information you can get, I'll, I'll accept. And you know, do I want to go see 15 practices? You know, may, maybe not. But would I like to see more than one? Yeah. Yeah. When it comes right down to it, Ohio State Buckeyes Live is brought to you by these three. You've got Tony Gerdeman from Buckeyes Scoop. Check out his work right there. Tony Gerdeman, Buckeyes Scoop. Kevin Noon from Rivals Buckeye Grove. And Steve Hellwagon from 247 Sports Bucknuts. And when it comes right down to it again, there is no show without these three. I can talk Ohio State football throughout the week, but these guys cover it every day, all day, know it inside and out. I can talk about it. I've got a handle on it, but these guys know exactly what they're talking about concerning every facet of Ohio State football. So when we get them on here every Wednesday, it is a treat. So the individual contributions by you keep this thing going and keep it fueled. Vinay, we thank you so much for the uh, Super Chat contribution right there. Uh, Vinay, um, talking about um, thoughts on his friend, Kion Grays, who is the 17th rated wide receiver in the country, according to the 247 Sports Composite. Uh, one of the top players out of Arizona who committed to the Buckeyes, Kevin, this week. Right, exactly. He had a uh, multi-day visit to uh, Columbus. Really ended up committing while he was on his visit. Uh, took a little bit of time for it to get out there. Uh, committed on the Sunday as he was in the process of flying back to the greater Phoenix area. You know, rivals just moved him up into the into the 250. Uh, I think he's in the 150s, maybe the 170s. I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, the, some similarities to Chris Olave in high school. I think Olave may have been a little further along at this point, but Keon, you know, he, he had the opportunity to stand there and interview him over in front of Ohio Stadium. He kind of sized him up, listed as like six one, buck seventy or so. He checks the boxes there. You watch his tape. I mean, he he's somebody who can do a lot of things. It just goes to prove that. Uh, Ryan Day and Brian Hartline have receiver recruiting on lockdown with these guys that they're able to get. Uh, Keon was supposed to visit Oregon before making a decision. Obviously, that didn't happen. He saw everything that he wanted to in Columbus, and I think he is a guy that's going to have the opportunity to be successful. But let me say this about receivers. When you look at this class, you look at Caleb Burton, and you look at Keon Grays. You, you go to the previous class, and you look at Mecca Ibuka, Jaden Ballard, and, and Marvin Harrison Jr., there's going to be a lot of competition. So when opportunity arises, you better be there to answer it because there's not going to be a lot of chances for that to come back around and for you to get a second chance. So you need to be ready. You need to put in the work. And, I, and you know, having the chance to talk to Keon and his, and his mom, you know, I, I really think that he's the kid that has just all of the intangibles to be a very successful not only athlete on the field, but young man as he gets ready to go to college here in a couple of years, once he gets to that point, I think he checks off all those boxes. Yes. Yeah, so, I'm sorry. No, I'm that's up, yeah. okay. I'm up. You guys can go if you'd like. Uh, you don't need to, but uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say this in addition to Steve, uh, and you can go ahead, obviously, with anything that you've got, but uh this wide receiver haul by the Buckeyes over the last three years during the Ryan Day stay, stint is just seems to be unprecedented. It it is, uh, you know, Gray's. I don't think um, is is. I mean, for from the twenty four seven composite, which takes all the different rankings into account, he's number one twenty seven nationally, which is lower than you know some of these other guys that they've taken, but. Everybody seems to be of a high opinion of him. Uh, listed 6'1", 170. That's probably outdated. I assume he's a little bigger than that. Uh, a lot of times those uh, things are inputted when the guys are in their sophomore or junior year, which I guess he'd be wrapping up his, uh, his junior year right now. But, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, the sky seems to be the limit for him. He's a national top 20 wide receiver, top 20 within that position group number two player overall in Arizona. And again, Chandler, Arizona, playing against a top competition there in the Phoenix area. So uh, very competitive. I, I have no reason to believe that uh, 
the Buckeyes uh, didn't scout this guy properly and, and have uh, a lot of good things in mind for him. I mean, you'd say he's coming in on the back end of what looks like an amazing haul of wide receivers over a two- or three-year period, but there's a reason why the Buckeyes wanted him. There's a reason why he's coming from two time zones away to play for the Buckeyes. So is this another Chris Olave situation that they see somebody who has just got uh, tremendous uh, ability? Uh, perhaps that's what it is. I don't know. But uh, I am intrigued by this prospect. And certainly, uh, uh, you know, Ohio State uh, is kind of just the snowball running downhill right now when it comes to recruiting offensive talent. Uh, they're in a position where they're selecting players to become part of what's become a really exciting offense to watch. You know, I think Ohio State has nine receivers on the roster right now who are top former top 100 guys, and Chris Olave, of course, is not one of them. Uh, but when, as Kevin said, when you watch Keon Gray's and his highlights from last year, he reminds you of Chris Olave, same size, same production out wide, deep down the field. And I think it's interesting in the seven on seven, this, this, I guess we're still considering it winter. He's been working exclusively in the slot, which, um, you know, is that where he ends up at Ohio state? If so, that's a position of great usage. And, and as you're seeing with Garrett Wilson, as we've seen with Paris Campbell and KJ Hill and on and on and Philly Brown, even before then. So I, I really like him and it's, um, smart kid. You listen, I mean, he's done so many interviews. He's savvy. Uh, I think every single outlet has talked to him, you know, on, on camera and each time he's impressive and he's well-spoken and just ha has a plan. And um, if you're a receiver with a plan, it's not a surprise that you may end up at Ohio state. Now, now comes where I, they have to play all of these guys, um, or at least six or seven of them, because with the the free year that we're they're, you know, the free transfer year, guys can can go and play immediately somewhere else next year. So you kind of have to keep guys happier than you did in the past. But also this year, I think Ohio State is more capable of rotating their receivers because Julian Fleming and G Scott and Jackson Smith and Jigbo are all a year older, and so they're they're able to handle more. And so. I think you'll see more uh, more rotating this year. And then when Keanu Grays arrives next year with Kayla Burton and I'm sure another another top 100 guy with them, um, you know, it's, it's just you lose Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson after this year, assuming Garrett Wilson goes pro, and then you just bring in more and everybody just takes one step to the left, and now you've got 60 catches. Even though David Knight was able to pretty much single-handedly uh, sponsor the show by himself last week, he was able to get his vid back on uh, Saturday, so that's good to see. Uh, David Greenshield, uh, can you guys see Seven Banks making a Damon Arnett-like improvement in 2021? Arnett um, was able to play himself into, the, into being a first-round uh, selection and taking off in the NFL as well. I think that'd be very much appreciated by Kerry Combs if he does that. Uh, I think he's got the physical and uh, athletic ability to do that. I think he's standing there, looks like a first-round draft pick at the cornerback position, and we saw him do some amazing uh, things at times, but uh, consistency at times was lacking, I think, for uh, Banks as well as uh, the rest of that secondary. So. Um, I look at it that uh, those guys are going to benefit uh, tremendously from what should be a good spring practice going against the best wide receiver group in the country uh, will only help them in practice going against Olave and Wilson and Smith, the Jigba and Fleming and, and everybody else, uh, G Scott and everybody else who's part of that group. So Jameson Williams as well. That's six pretty good wide receivers there, plus anybody else who's enrolled early or uh, still there. So I am um, I'm very optimistic about Seven Banks. I think you know he's got tremendous upside. I just think it was a case where it was somewhat of a baptism by fire, and they went against some very good wide receivers last year. When you talk about some of the teams that they played against, in particular, that were able to do some great things against them, like Indiana and Al. Any thoughts on Seven Banks, boys? Well, Anything else? Uh, I, th I think that it's important based on uh, 
who's around him as well. I mean, it's it's really you know everybody looks at an individual. I just can't stop looking at his frozen picture there. Um, I think it's a matter of when you when you uh, you sit there and you see who's with you in the secondary, and and that's going to determine how much you're going to be tested and what it is you're going to face and what, and everything else. And I mean, I don't think that's anything that's unique to uh, to playing corner. As I'm trying to reset my shot. Ah. I, I, produce, you guys man, off produce. I, I don't know. We dropped the four shot into a three, and now I'm out of out of whack. Uh, you know, I think there he's certainly talented. He has the physical skills, but I think a lot of it's just going to be predicated on who's around him. Because you know, what happens if he ends up being kind of the corner of record out there in terms of stuff, and they just kind of go away from him, and then people are like, "Well, look, he's doing great." Well, no, they're not throwing at him. So you know, I think I'll. A lot of it determines on the uh, on the recovery of Cameron Brown and just what they're able to get from the younger guys behind them. And and honestly, we all know that we're pushed better when we're you know we perform better when we're being pushed. So it would be in his best interest to have some of these young guys there pushing him because once you get that starting spot, of course, com- competitors want to compete and keep getting better. But when you're having to look over your shoulder to sit there and see that young guy trying to take that spot from you, I think that will help with the development as well. You know, it's funny. I keep thinking that it's the other corners behind seven banks who need to step up, but yeah, he he still needs to step up. I expect it to happen. I mean, he's a starting cornerback at Ohio state and that means something. I, I wrote this week that um, there've been Ohio state has had 28 starting cornerbacks since 1995 and only six haven't been drafted. And they've all been drafted within the first four rounds. So you play cornerback at Ohio State, you are an NFL player. And he needs to uh, – I mean, he's 6'1", 200 pounds, fast, long, exactly what you want in your corner. Now, um, you know, l- last year was a tough year to be a, a first-year starter because there was a pandemic going on and it's tough to develop. And I, I don't think we should ever – I don't think you can gloss over that. I think you have to acknowledge – that development was tough last year. And so that's um, now, now that's gone, gone. Uh, it's not gone yet, but they are back on campus and they are trying to keep things as normal as possible. So I would expect him to be fine. Now is fine, you know, Kendall Sheffield, or is it, you know, Jeff Okuda uh, uh, somewhere in there, I think is, is, Good. I still think this defense comes down to who's at safety more than who's at corner. I think the corners will be good. Corners will be good enough. It's, you know, who's that last line of defense and, and what kind of pass rush are you getting? Seven banks, 23 tackles last year, had himself a pick back in uh, 2019. Uh, talking Ohio State football each and every Wednesday with these guys, depending on basketball schedules, you can usually catch us at 2 p.m. Eastern time as it stands right now as we go into a bit of a justin fields conversation because there has been all sorts of talk about him plummeting down the draft board and seems to be based on all these mock drafts and shoot there's now about 27 quarterbacks better than him apparently uh at what point do you guys kind of let that go in regards to ohio state following the the football talent out the door at ohio state while you guys are trying to keep track of basketball and the current football team but he's got you got the, the NFL draft. You guys pretty much take the approach, Tony, to take it to the NFL draft and then kind of let them loose and kind of keep track to a certain extent. Uh, I, I keep an eye on it. I haven't written about it yet. Like once the draft happens, yeah, yeah well, I'll do that. Or, you know, maybe go to the combine in years where there would be one. Um, but I don't get into the, although it's probably it's more of a column than a, a news thing, just the the number of people picking apart Justin Fields. Uh, but in, in terms of just covering it, no, I, I maybe I should do more of it. Um, but with spring going on and basketball going on, maybe if maybe if I wasn't also doing basketball, I would be doing more NFL draft stuff. Uh, but I, I do follow it. I, I enjoy it. I just uh, I don't know if we want to go into this right now, but with with Fields, the way he's being picked apart, and I saw the uh, somebody posted um, about Chris Sims having Kellen Mond ahead of Justin Fields. There's, I don't know where it goes on the leaderboard of quarterbacks, but at some point, they stop looking at all of the bad stuff. Like 
Justin Fields, they look at all of the bad stuff so they can move him down. But then you get to Kellen Mond and you're like, well, look at all the good stuff he can do. And it's like, but and I've I've seen a little bit of Kellen Mond. I've seen a lot of bad stuff. At what point do I think they you ignore the stuff that Kellen Mond does poorly because you like the stuff he does well, but and, and the stuff that he does well moves him up. And, but I will tell you this, Justin Fields does a lot more stuff well than he does poorly, but for some reason the stuff that he does poorly is pulling him down. So I, I don't know like which – why – at what point do you like, oh, I like this guy's upside, and, and, and that is more than, oh, I just – you know, I, I just don't know. Justin Fields sure locks onto his first receiver, and it's like, well, yes – because it's Chris Olave and he's running 40 yards downfield and fields can throw at 60. So yeah, he's going to be looking for a little bit. And then Chris Olave always gets open, you know, gets open a lot. So yes, there, there's going to be some time there, but I, um, it's just interesting to me the way Justin Fields is being picked apart. And I've even got, you know, scouts in my DM saying, yeah, he's not that good. He's not this, he's not that. And I, I just, you know, for some people, you look for the stuff that you you don't like, and other quarterbacks, you look for the stuff you do like and ignore the stuff that you don't like because I don't because I, I think you're I don't know if it's bias or what, but like what is it about one quarterback where the the upside is more important than another quarterback's? There's there's some Dwayne Haskins hangover there too, yeah. I think because Dwayne didn't pan out in his first run in the NFL, and I think that there are going to be people that are going to hold that against not only Justin Fields, but any Ohio State quarterback, excuse me, any Ohio State quarterback until somebody really breaks through. I mean, Ohio State has not produced those NFL quarterbacks through the years in terms of successful, uh, fruitful careers. I mean, you know, you could sit there and say, well, you know, you know, Mike Tomzak, you know, he was on a championship team, and then, of course, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Arch Schleister before all, you know, everything truly came to light there. But, you know, there weren't, there haven't been a ton of Ohio State uh, successful quarterbacks in the league. But, uh, yeah, I, I have the Chris Sims list in front of me. And, you know, as much as I want to take, you know, take it to task over having Justin Fields behind Kellen Mond, him having Zach Wilson ahead of Sunshine is, is an issue for me, too. So, and, you know, of course, one of his compatriots is out there. It's like, well, you remember this time that Chris Sims was right? Well, you know, blind, blind squirrel, acorn, all of that, you know, all that garbage out there too. But uh, it's, you know, it's a it's a curious list looking there because, you know, Justin Fields was going to be, you know, he was competing with, with uh, Trevor Lawrence for the one spot. And then it was pretty much determined that, all right, it was going to be Lawrence in the one and Fields in the two. And now you've got people that are trying to move Fields down to seven or to ten or or whatnot, and you have to wonder, just a lot of times, too, that you hear this posturing, it's kind of like watching American Pickers, and they find that, you know, they find that that barn find of a, of, a, of a Chevrolet out there, and they're like, oh, well, you know, that's dented a little bit, and that's only because they're just trying to drive the price down so they can come in and, and swoop in and get them. You know, I'm, I'm not concerned about what Justin Fields' future is going to be in terms of the NFL. I've seen enough. I think that we're – he differs just from a, a of a standpoint of numbers from Dwayne Haskins. Is Dwayne Haskins was only a starter for one year, whereas Justin Fields was truly a starter for two years. And there's just you know a, a major uptick of success when you're a multi-year starter in college and then trying to go to the pros. Yes, I've talked to some draft experts even on uh, my own podcast about he does lock on a little bit. Sometimes he doesn't get through progressions. But every time I see that argument come out there, I see another draft person come out there with film study and it's like, well, look at this. He completely goes through his, his progressions. And to go on what Tony says, if if Chris Olave or Garrett Wilson's the first read and they're open, I mean, you're really not, you know, you're really not hurting yourself by going to him. I mean, yes, Justin Fields had a couple of step backs this season in terms of some of the decisions he made, but you could also predicate that by saying no spring, no traditional summer. You don't have the opportunity to work out with the guys as much. Maybe there just were some things that were not mechanically right because of that. But, uh, you know, I think that putting Kellen Mond ahead of Justin Fields is just is, is either clickbait garbage, laughable or idiotic. I mean, just one or a combination of the three, because I watched a good amount of Kellen Mond 
And I was never impressed with him. And I've always been very careful. I don't trash amateur kids, but he's getting ready to get in the draft. So the hell with that. He's he's not very good. Jack Cohen? Yeah, I just suffice to say. Oh, oh, he deserved it. He, he said something about my mother once. Go, Tony, if you had something, go no, ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, my only thing is, again, we watched – fields for what it was 20 games or however many total games it was and I'm pretty content in believing and thinking he's going to be a good NFL quarterback is he going to go in and and be a Super Bowl winner in his first year probably not does he need uh, really good coaching somebody who can bring him along and be alongside good players yeah everybody needs that quarterback is a function of everybody around them and what's unfortunate is like Joe Burrow gets put into a basically an untenable situation uh, with, you know, a very poor offensive line and a wide receiver group that's kind of in flux and, you know, those kind of things and, and, and a team that's just not any good. And, yeah, it was a little bit of a freak accident the way that he got injured. It wasn't necessarily because the offensive line was terrible, but, uh, you know, in some regard, uh, you know, again, it puts him in a tough spot. So, I think you have to come back in, in three to five years and assess, you know, what what somebody uh, – did, did they back up with where they were drafted and those kind of things. But I am pretty content in believing he's going to be a good NFL quarterback. And, um, again, uh, this is what these guys get paid to do is make these assessments. I'm talking about the, the clubs, not necessarily – uh, Kuiper and, and uh, Todd, 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 Todd McShay and everybody else. But, uh, yeah, um, you know, it's just fodder for the grist mill right now is all it is. And uh, something to get, uh, you know, the hot stove leak burning. I don't worry too much about it. In the, addition – yeah, go ahead, Tony. Well, well the, the Chris Sims thing where – I saw the same thing Kevin did where somebody was giving him props like, hey, you know, Chris Sims, he got Pat, Pat Mahomes right. And it's like, well, it reminds me of a time I was like five years old, me and my brother out shooting BB guns. And, um, you know, the first time I ever shot, I went to point up near and I shot a bird out of the sky. All right. I'm not a dead eye. That was just pure luck that I was able to hit a bird with one shot out of out of the air. And getting Pat, Pat Mahomes right. Um he was the second quarterback drafted in 2017 behind Mitch Trubisky, and only one team had Mitch Trubisky as the number one quarterback in the draft. So I'm, I'm guessing more team, more than just just Chris Sims, had Pat Mahomes rated very highly in the NFL draft. It's just the, the teams drafting where they were maybe didn't need a quarterback at that time. So let's let's not go overboard on saying he was the only one who thought Patrick Mahomes could be a, a good quarterback. But I just the, the Kellen Mond thing, I. And I understand why he's, he likes Zach Wilson because he sees a lot of Mahomes in there, and, and I'm sure we all do. But I I don't know how you can look at the bad of Kellen Mond and then look at the bad of Justin Fields and not see more from Mond and 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 look at the good from Justin Fields and look at the good from Kellen Mond and see more from Kellen Mond in, in either way. And uh, so yes, I would. I would dispute him on that as the resident resident uh, guy who always gets quarterbacks wrong, but I'm okay with that. In addition to all the obvious physical skill set that Justin Fields brings to the table, which is, again, obvious, you guys talked about it. I still remember Tony describing how the ball comes out of his hand, how it whistles through the air, how it, you guys just knew there was a different dude on the field at the first time. Uh, you were on the same practice field with Justin Fields, and we saw it. We saw it play out. So in addition to all the physical stuff, the two things that make me trust in Justin Fields performing at the next level is, number one, he's a really intelligent guy. And I think he's also got enough humility in him that he's going to be coachable. So he's going to learn. And then number two is what I saw when the Big Ten season was in jeopardy and how he led a charge and fought to get on the football field. And then once he did, when the biggest game of his life was in front of him, and people are going to argue the Alabama game then came the next week, well, let's focus on what the Clemson game meant to him and meant to this team that he had been shooting for all that time. And a lot of people, and this is not a criticism to a, a typical athlete that would be gunning for that type of stage and that type of retribution 
would then maybe build that up to be too much and would freeze in the moment. He lit it up like, like nobody expected. And he took a shot to the ribs that screwed up his ribs and hip for the rest of that game and still delivered. So he's showing me intelligence, guts, and leadership. And he's prototype height, arm, athleticism, and um, but but did you see him against Indiana? He has flaws. I saw him throw three bad passes against Indiana, but I think he chucked it about thirty or thirty-five times in that game. <laughs> Again, if you, if, I mean, if these scouts and people out there don't, you know, they need to have something to talk about. I mean, that's so you know, it is what it is, and. You know, as as I think it was Steve who said, you know, ch- check back in a couple years, and then we'll you know we'll kind of know where we were and everything on this. But uh, you know, if I'm an NFL front office and I'm looking for a quarterback, and you know we get to four and Justin Fields hasn't been picked, I'm I'm you know I'm looking at what I can do to get him there if I need a quarterback because I think he's going to be pretty special. Uh, yeah, uh, to, to echo something I do remember Steve saying. Is he going to probably lead a team to a Super Bowl year one? Probably not, but I don't think that teams that are that close to getting to the Super Bowl are going to be picking in the top five, seven picks or whatnot. But, uh, you know, pass on uh, at your own risk is what I'm saying. I mean, there's a team like Cincinnati doesn't need to, to go after that. They need to get somebody to protect Joe Burrow. But there are a lot of teams out there that have uh, – some serious flaws at quarterback and Justin Fields is somebody that you can put in there, especially if you don't have to throw him out there into the wolves immediately that I think that could uh, lead your team for quite some time. Plus, as we know, Joe Burrow is afraid of competition, so he would just quit. More than likely. I'll go back to the same infield draft that uh, Tony brought up in 2017, four years ago and bring up another quarterback to Sean Watson and during the same process in which he ultimately was drafted 10 spots lower than Mitchell Trubisky, I, I was thinking the whole time, okay, I keep hearing all these criticisms and I'm not a scout. I just watch a lot of football, but I'm not anything close to being a scout. But man, didn't I just see that guy two consecutive years take on most likely the best defense in college football and lift in, inferior would be a, lesser talent past um, an Alabama defense and put up 40 and 45 points and 500 yards of total offense and pull out the game the second time. And he just made the throws in the plays. Yeah. He was my guy and I'm a bears fan. So, but we <laughs> might get him in the off season. That's we'll see. I'd All be more right. of a bears fan if they had him. Let's just say that. We'll see what kind of fan you are when they uh, have to trade away the farm to get them or whatever. We see a Herschel Walker type of of trade in that situation. David Knight is insistent on making a similar super chat contribution analogy to Justin Fields against Clemson, basically is what he's shooting for here. David, thank you so much for the contribution. We appreciate it so much. David called me a couple of weeks ago asking about John Bronkington. So, so we can uh, pass this on. Could John Bronkington have been a top 10 NFL rusher if he was able to avoid knee injuries? So for you who are not old timers, John Bronkington was, I believe, I remember reading at some point and it's stuck in my head that he was the first NFL running back in history of the league to either rush for a thousand yards, his first three, or it might've been four NFL seasons going from the Ohio State Buckeyes to the Green Bay Packers in the early 70s and won himself a national championship. So, man, I'm going to leave it up to you three about John Bronkington. And, David, thank you again so much for the generosity. Yeah, I'll I'll say, of course, I was born about the time he was playing for the Buckeyes in 1968, so I have no firsthand knowledge. But, uh, you know, everything I've – ever read, never been told was he was just a dynamic athlete and that uh, Woody Hayes uh, obviously saw the benefit in getting the ball into the hands. It was kind of a, you know, a thunder and lightning combination that they had there back at that time. I mean, Jim Otis was kind of the, um, 
uh, I think he was the thumper and, uh, you know, Brockington was, was kind of the, the lightning part of that. And uh, they had other guys as well that were part of those championship teams. And of course, Rex Kern is the quarterback. He was a little bit of a runner as well. So, um, you know, I think that uh, they had some great players in that stretch and uh, could he have been, uh, even better. And well, certainly I think, uh, you know, you think about guys uh, who've gone to the NFL, like Gail Sayers uh, career cut short because of injuries. Uh, you know, I think Brockington probably along the same way. Um, Green Bay, you know, that was kind of like after the, after the circus had left town, you know, they were great in the sixties, but uh, you know, the seventies, not, uh, not quite as much there as they were moving toward the mid seventies. But uh you know, certainly um, he could have had a great NFL career. And, and again, he's, he's spoken about in uh, hushed tones in Ohio State uh, lore just because of everything he was able to do playing for those Woody Hayes teams that uh, won so big back then in the, the late 1960s. But, yeah, he was a special, special player, no doubt about it. And I think, uh, again, um, kind of – uh, an early uh, forerunner, I think, to, to a lot of the type of uh, offensive threats that we've seen, you know, come about here in the last, you know, 30, 40 years, I would say. Yeah, his rookie year was the year I was born. So I didn't have I didn't have the opportunity to see him really play. I mean, his NFL career went through 77. So, I mean, I would have been about ready to turn six at that point. So not a lot of memories at that point, but you know, everything that I've read about him, I certainly think that, uh, you know, he was, you know, he was a back for his time and he would have, you know, if, if he would have been able to remain healthy and everything, I think that he certainly could have, you know, been up there, you know, with the great backs of, of his era. I mean, I think that as you look at any major professional sport, you have, you know, it's, it's not like baseball as much of where you're like, this is the dead ball era and this is the live ball era. I think we go through generations. I mean, it, how, how do you compare running backs who were playing in the early 70s to running backs that you saw in the 90s or the running backs you're seeing today? I don't know how you do that, but, uh, you know, just, I'm just basing this on things that I've read and talked to people since I don't have any firsthand witnessing of his play, but, uh, I don't think David's far off in what he what what his uh, his statement is. You know, I was just reading his sports reference page, and he's listed as a fullback. And as Kevin's talking, you know, the difference between a fullback back then and a fullback today is completely different. You know, fullback back then was just another ball carrier. Now it's it's a quasi uh, offensive lineman slash third tight end, and. Um, you know, well before my time, but anytime you start out with three years of a thousand yards rushing, that's what it takes. But then you think how many guys lost their careers ended with like an ACL or whatever back then, just because you know, the medical advancements weren't there yet. And it was just, you know, that's well, you play until your knee blows out and then you're done. And then you have a, a limp the rest of your life until maybe uh, you can get a, a new knee later on. But yeah, just another one where, so many guys, you you wonder what what could have been if not just for a random injury in a a very violent sport where seemingly everybody was trying to kill you back then. And again, thousand yards, three consecutive seasons right out of the gate. And I'm almost positive again that that was an NFL record at the time. And one of the reasons that was so difficult is they only played 14 games, and they were only a few years removed from only playing 12 games, which I think took us through. 1965, I believe, is the year that uh, they went from 12 to 14 games, then into the Super Bowl era, AFL, NFL, 66, and then the AFC, NFC, and the merger in 1970. And you bring up fullbacks. Uh, John Brockington basically took over for, I believe, Jim Otis, who was the primary back for that 68 championship team, and Brockington for the team that some would award a national championship in 1970 despite a Rose Bowl loss. That was his big year that vaulted him into the NFL with 1,000 yards and 17 touchdowns for the Buckeyes in 1970. And, hey, back then, 25 receptions for a career in three seasons. That was, that was pretty good stuff. Uh, don't show Woody that stat. He might have uh, <laughs> might turn over in his grave. Yeah, I remember back, then, back 25 times. One of the years, Fred Puggett Sr. led the team in receptions with nine 
Although, hey, 2011, or, Ohio State yeah. leading receiver had 14 catches. Now, there are three of them. There's, and it was a clown show. Yes. I mean, somebody yes. told me that. I think his name was Urban Meyer or whatever, called it a, called it a clown show. <laughs> was, that, was that the Jake Stone burner, like every other catch Philly was Brown. a touchdown year? Yeah, Stoneburner, Philly Brown, and Devin Smith, I believe, were the were the I think Stoneburner was like 14 catches and like seven or eight touchdowns. Good That's stuff. a guy who uh, I I thought he could have been really great, but again, playing tight end at Ohio State, you know, how how great will you end up? Yeah, John Franks has become uh, close to the gold standard there, who turned into a two-time Super Bowl champion. I think Jeremy Ruckert will get there this year. Good call, good call. The Rod Farva asking about the linebackers. Would like to know what you guys feel about the linebackers and who should be starting. And I know Kevin's going to jump on this in regards to how do we know who's going to start now? We got to see a lot of football, and they got to work through this. I was going to I was going to defer to my to my friends and say I guess uh, that way. Uh, I don't know. I need I need to see some spring at this point. I mean, you could obviously default and say well. You know, Dallas Gant and uh, Taraja Mitchell and Kayvon Pope. I mean, it's their turn, but, you know, there's nothing Nothing is given. But if you look at the snaps that were uh, taken last year, uh, especially with Gant and Mitchell, those were kind of the next guys up at that point. But, uh, you know, what happens if Court Williams comes out at 100% and is able to overtake somebody? I mean, there certainly are some, some young guys that are ready to snap up and, and take those spots. So, uh, I'll, I'll I'll hang up and listen because I I really don't know if I'm ready to uh, make a call on on linebackers that are months out. You're muted. I was muted. Sorry. I think they are starting with a clean slate, and Al Washington is uh, starting at ground zero with this because uh, the best players have to play, and uh, the defense is really really. Uh, counting on some difference makers emerging at linebacker. I mean, this is almost like it was in 2014 when they kind of turned the page and, and Darren Lee and um, uh, Grant and McMillan and um, uh, Josh, Perry. Uh, Josh Perry. Thank you for passing that name on. Those guys emerged, and I don't think any of them had really been frontline guys prior to that. And it's kind of like you just hope you get that kind of an impact uh, by the end of the season. At the beginning of the season, it was not what it needed to be. Going back to that Navy game, they took bad angles. And, and of course, Navy's going to make you look bad uh, trying with your run fits and that type of a, a game. But uh, I think, um, you know, that's kind of where they're at. They're back running down the first baseline at linebacker right now. And uh, they need a bunch of guys. Uh, four or five of them to really step up. What struck me is uh, from – I watched a little bit of linebacker tape today, actually, uh, a couple games just trying to pinpoint who was doing what. And it seemed to me that when they when they were, the limited opportunities they got in the game, the Gantt was more of uh, the boundary or the strong side guy as well as a middle linebacker. And uh, Mitchell was more the, the wide side, the weak side guy and a middle linebacker at times and that uh, Pope, you know, could fit in either way, I guess. And I don't know, it just, it's hard to really get, get a gauge of what Al Washington is thinking about these guys because they kind of all cross-trained and uh, played different positions throughout the season. So I think what they're going to do is uh, try each of them in every spot and see what uh, where the guys fit the best and then figure out who the best three are from there and then figure out if there's any kind of situational thing that plays to somebody's strengths. Like I think uh, Craig Young seemed like he was a good guy coming off the edge uh, from the, the weak side or the wide side to come off the edge and rush the passer at times perhaps in the early season. He must have gotten hurt because he, did, according to the snap counts I saw, he didn't play the last four games. But, uh, you know, early on he was playing as much as 20 snaps in some games. So – um, to me, he's a guy that may have moved past Pope a little bit, uh, at least early in the season, uh, to get some of that critical playing time. So, again, I want to see how it all shakes out this spring. you got the young guys, Eichenberg and Melton, uh, Court Williams, and I'm missing one more guy. I always forget the names. 
Uh, yeah, Cody Simon in there. Cody Simon, yes, Cody Simon. I'm always missing a name, and they're all varying sizes. And it's kind of like, you know, do you just put the biggest guy at middle linebacker? It's not always that way. So, you know, I don't know. I think again, a lot for Al Washington. Kerry comes to sift through, and uh, I don't have any doubt that they'll be they'll have three linebackers on the field for the first game. But I I can't tell you who they are, and I can't tell you where they're going to line up just yet. I'm not so sure they'll have three linebackers to to start the season. Maybe they maybe it's a four two five, where maybe they they go to more of a, a, a hybrid, and go with a, a nickel. But they do need to replace the three guys, and they also they need to replace Justin Hilliard, who was a do it all guy, and just you know, sure you want your starters, but you also want that one guy that can come in and, and replace anybody. And yeah, as Steve said, Craig Young was the guy early in. He was playing ahead of. Gave on Pope, and then he disappeared. And maybe he, you know, like maybe it was an injury. We don't, we don't hear a lot. I don't even remember seeing him on any of the uh, availability reports uh, back then. But um, yeah, so is he still ahead of Gave on Pope, or you know, is one of those guys the Sam? And does it matter this spring until um, we see what Court Williams does? And where is Court Williams when he's healthy this fall? I think for me that will kind of decide what the rest, what the defense looks like. Cause I think he's the guy who maybe he is your Sam, your bullet, your, your hybrid guy. And he may play a lot. And, and Craig Young being six, four and athletic, is, is he able to do similar things? I think so. Um, Kayvon Pope, I think he could play inside. He could play outside, but like, I, I, I think Dallas can is probably your middle linebacker. He's been your, backup middle linebacker for the previous two years. Taraji Mitchell has been the backup at will for the last two years. So I assume that's where he'll be. And then you let spring happen and see, because now those guys, there's nobody ahead of them, but that doesn't mean there isn't anybody behind them. And so they're going to have to hold off those guys behind them. I am recognizing every name on the 2021 class list of 21 signed commits except for a four-star linebacker, the only linebacker that they signed in this class, and that's inside linebacker, and it might be because he's been committed for so long, Reed Carrico out of Ironton, Ohio. What's the read on him? Pardon the pun. Reed certainly has the look. I mean, he certainly – he's a guy that can play multiple positions. I think that he's somebody that will be a multi-year starter. And I'll even go so far as to say I think he'll be a multi-year captain while he's at Ohio State. I think that highly of him. Uh, it's going to be a crowded field. But, I mean, again, when you lose your top four linebackers, I mean, th there's there's no greater opportunity than that at that point to be, I guess, unless you lose your top five linebackers, uh, to be able to to walk into the room. And if you go out there and you bring it and you show it, to be able to, to get in there. But I think that uh, Reed Carrico is somebody that, you know, while it may not happen in year one in terms of playing linebacker, I immediately pencil him into special teams. I think he's somebody that uh, that if we were not under these weird times in terms of the free year and everything else, I think that they would absolutely use his four games uh, to not burn a red shirt just to see what he's able to do. Maybe even burn the red shirt because, uh, you know, I think the world of him, I think he's uh, probably one of the players in that class that we – talk about the least that we should be talking about a lot more. Yeah, he's a tackling machine and uh he won't it probably won't start this year, but they lose they lost four guys this year. They lose three guys after this coming year and there's going to be opportunities for him to start and I think he could play any of the three linebacker positions and I would pencil him in in 22 as a starting linebacker at will or the mic without seeing him yet, you know. Take away my buckeye card. For not being aware of Reed Carrico, 86 rated player. You need to go down and see him. You need to go eat at the Scioto River in Portsmouth while you're down there. It's a, it's a. There, there's a pretty good brewery down there in Portsmouth as well. I mean, it's it's a it's a fun trip. Uh, Steve's buying. There we go. <laughs> He's on mute. He can't say anything. So I'm, we... I'm good. I'm good with that. <laughs> I'd be there. Well, it's not like the guy's laying in the weeds, uh, fifth-rated at his position, third-rated player in the state. I just somehow missed him. I went down the list, and I was like, I'm going to look for linebackers here. I could only find one, and I'm like, this is the only dude I don't recall his name. Wow. Okay. Reed Carrico. 
becomes, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, becomes Carico. uh Carico. Yeah. I asked him point blank because my yeah. recruiting guy was calling him Reed Carico as well. I'm like, I don't think that's right. And I went down to go see him during uh some summer workouts, and I was like, Look, just set me straight because I don't want to mispronounce anybody's name except for maybe the kid out of Washington State, and I'll probably never get his name right. But uh, and he's like, no, it's Carico. So, yeah. Yes. Kevin is like, how do you pronounce your name? And he's like, Reed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and Ricardo, by the way, um, I appreciate the NFL questions, but uh, I will not be taking those. Uh, when we start our NFL channel, uh, in 2032, we'll I get to your NFL, NFL questions. is very popular. That's what I hear. That's uh, that's the rumor out there that few people are not admitting to that, but uh, people watch it uh, and just don't talk about it, I guess. It's like wrestling. Even under wraps. I know that the NFL schedule release is the most overrated event of the year of the sports calendar. I do know that. That's one of my angst against the league, but uh, it's not their fault. It's right up there with the Dodgers pitchers and catchers reporting. It's like, who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Stupid Dodgers. (laughs) (laughs) Did they finally win a World Series? They finally got it done, huh? Finally got it done. They finally got it done. So uh, see see in 30 more years or whatever the heck it is. The way they're spending, I mean, picking up Trevor Bauer and everything else and and re-signing Justin Turner, they got a shot. We'll see. I think that uh, any time that L.A. and San Diego plays each other this year, it's going to be must-see TV, but don't worry. The four-letter network is going to still beat over our heads at Boston. Uh, New York Yankees are what we need to watch and live our lives by. Yeah, their 18 games are the most eight, important 18 games of the entire season, so – All right, Ohio State football talk, and we didn't even get to the NFL Combine or whatever it uh, is morphed into this year, but we'll get to that uh, next week. We got, uh, of course, check out Steve Hellwagon's work at uh, Bucknuts, Tony Gerdeman, Buckeye Scoop, and, of course, Kevin Noon, Buckeye Grove. Man, these guys do an amazing job just in the little slice that we get each and every week. And uh, we appreciate everyone who appreciates their efforts. So thank you so much for that. All right, boys. Appreciate you coming on. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks. See you.